Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Robertson with RBC Consultants. We are excited to bring you tonight's International Dermatology Education Foundation Education Series webinar. Tonight's title is New Approaches in the Treatment of Mild to Severe Acne with Avaclear. As moderator tonight, we have Dr. James Del Rosso. He is a research director and principal investigator, JDR Dermatology Research in Las Vegas, Nevada, Senior Vice President of Clinical Research and Strategic Development, Advanced Dermatology and Cosmetic Surgery in Maitland, Florida, and President-elect American Acne and Rosacea Society. As speaker today, we have Dr. Emmy Graber. She's a board-certified dermatologist and founder of the Dermatology Institute of Boston, affiliate clinical instructor of Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. We would like to thank our supporter this evening, Qtera, for making this event possible. A couple of logistic tips before we begin. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and it will be emailed to you within one to two days. We would greatly appreciate it if you could fill in this survey. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your questions in the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Just a reminder, when you registered, you may have seen that we are going to be doing an Apple AirPod drawing. Thank you so much to everyone who is participating with us this evening. The, that drawing will happen once the webinar has concluded. We will evaluate the list and everyone who stayed on for the entire program, and you will find out within the next 24 to 48 hours who the lucky winner is. Again, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please submit your questions using the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will have a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I would like to pass the floor virtually to Dr. Del Rosso. Thank you very much, Ashley. It's certainly a pleasure to have the opportunity to participate in this program tonight. My name is Jim Del Rosso, a dermatologist in Las Vegas, Nevada, and you don't need to hear about me anymore as Ashley went over my background. Um, I'm very happy to bring this program to you. I will tell you about a week ago, I was walking and I accidentally kicked the bottle and it was a special bottle because a genie came out and asked me if I had one wish. And I said, I'd wish that I'd love to be Leon Kersick when I grow up. A couple of days later, Leon called me and asked me to fill in for him tonight because he normally moderates these these programs, and I'm, I'm happy to do it. I didn't know it was going to happen that quick. So we're very happy to be talking about this tonight and having Dr. Graber discuss a very important therapy, which Dr. Graber has a lot of experience with. But I'd like to first introduce an individual from Kutera, uh, and if we could bring up the slide on Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. We can Steve Kreider, who is senior vice president of global marketing. Okay, we're bouncing back and forth on the slides. Let's go on the slide with <laughs> shows my inexperience. Let's bring back Dr. Kersick. Go back the slide with the other programs. Okay, no, the, with the programs, with the different seminars. Here, these are several of the previous educational seminars that have been run by IDEF. There are several excellent ones that you can see here. And tonight we have the one with Dr. Graber. And now I'd like to introduce Steve Kreider from Kutera. He is Senior Vice President of Global Marketing. He joined Kutera in 2022, and he has a longstanding background in dermatology. And he's going to talk to you more about the company and about what Dr. Graber will be discussing tonight. Steve? Thanks, Dr. Del Rosso. It's great to be with you. We've known each other a long, long time, and I, uh, I feel like I'm back home with my medical dermatology community um, since, uh, yeah, I mean, like a lot of you, I've been in this acne game for a while, almost two decades, and selling or marketing various uh, oral antibiotics and topical products for acne. Um, but when uh, Qtera uh, was coming to market with a 1726 nanometer wavelength laser, really suppressing the sebaceous gland, I had to be a part of it because this is truly an opportunity to part, be part of something that's uh, disruptive in a market that I think is, is ripe for it. So just a moment uh, about Qtera. We are celebrating our 25th anniversary. We are here in the Bay Area. So we were founded by engineers in Silicon Valley and uh, have always had a great heritage for making really, really exceptional quality laser devices. And some of those devices that you'll see on the next slide 
really some of them uh, go back to the early 2000s with Zio, the workhorse, still one of our leading lasers out there. I think a lot in the dermatology community are familiar with our XLV and the XLV Plus, which is a leading vascular laser. Uh, body contouring has certainly blown up in the last 10 years or so, and we've got a leading device with TrueSculpt. That's True Sculpt for non-invasive fat, True Flex for muscle uh, definition, which makes up the True Body portfolio. And then last year we launched AviClear for acne. Next slide. So I'm happy to hand it over to Dr. Emmy Graber. I know we'll get a uh, kind of a formal introduction here, but it's been a real pleasure to work with her in this role, somebody whose uh, experiences really overlap well with the acne space and the laser space. And she's just been tremendously helpful. We've gotten the uh, Avi clear off the ground. So Dr. Graber. Great, thank you so much, Steve. I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Could we go to the next slide? Sure, if you click in the middle, let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. So. Tonight I'm going to be obviously talking about Aviclear and new approaches in the treatment of mild to severe acne. I'll tell you just a bit about myself. I do a lot of acne. I kind of consider myself to be an acneologist. I mean, we all as dermatologists treat acne, but that has always been my passion. Um, I happen to have also done a laser fellowship. And so I have this private practice in Boston where I see a lot of acne patients, but I also do a lot of laser treatments for, for cosmetic reasons in the past. And, and so for years, I was having acne patients coming to me saying, you know, Dr. Graber, you have all these lasers here. I have acne, I want laser for my acne. And, and for years, I was saying prior to this past year, I was saying, no, I don't have anything. Nothing really works well for acne as far as a laser goes. And that has totally changed for me in the past year now that Aviclair has been out because I feel that we finally have a really great solid device to offer our patients with acne who want a laser approach. So Avaclear is a 1726 nanometer wavelength laser. So it is the first laser that has been FDA cleared in the United States of this wavelength. Tonight, I'm gonna to go over the technology just briefly. We'll talk about what a typical treatment looks like. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time going over the FDA clearance study, the study that was done to achieve FDA clearance for mild, moderate, and severe acne with a long duration of results. I'm gonna talk a little bit too about how Avaclear lines up compared to some of the other typical acne treatments that we use, and not that there are any head-to-head -head studies, but just kind of looking at a comparison. Of course, I'm going to spend a lot of time showing you photos of patient results because I think that's what we all really want to see. What is this going to look like for, for my patients? And I'm going to tell you how it's fit into my practice in the last year plus. So let's talk about the technology. I did mention that it was a unique wavelength. It is a 1726 nanometer wavelength. Well, what does that mean? If you're not a laser person, don't worry. All you really need to remember for this laser is think of it as being a SIBO suppressive device. So at this wavelength, it targets sebum. So the sebocytes, the sebaceous glands, specifically are targeted with the 1726 nanometer wavelength laser. So what does this look like histologically? So these are some histologic images five days after a treatment with Avaclair. So if you need a fresher refresher of what the sebaceous glands look like normally, on the left you can see the pre-treatment image and you see those nice pink, frothy, healthy sebaceous cells. And then on the right, you see five days after treatment, and you can see magnification of the sebaceous glands. You can see there is clearly damage in the sebaceous gland. But the great thing about this laser is that there is no other damage in the dermis. There's no other damage in the epidermis. It, the epidermis, in fact, remains completely intact but the damage is localized just to the sebaceous gland where we want it really for our acne patients. So just a basic 
breakdown of the treatment to kind of give you a, a visual picture as to how this works. It's roughly a 30 minute treatment. Um, it can be easily delegated. We'll talk more about that later. There is no anesthesia required for this treatment. Um, prior to the treatment, there's a cleanse. Patients have to be degreased with acetone. Patients are pink during the treatment. Most patients are no longer pink as they're walking out the door, and we'll talk about that, those results in the clinical study in a few slides. For a face, a treatment of a face, it's about 300 pulses. It is recommended to treat the entire face. People say, well, can I just treat my chin? No, because you, you treat the entire face because you'll see in the pictures that patients get a great improvement, not really just in their acne, but also in their overall skin quality. Their, their pores really look smaller. Their skin looks less greasy. And so we do encourage our patients to, to treat their whole face and not just the sections that may be afflicted with acne. All right, so just so you can have a visual before we go into talking about the clinical study, this was actually the, these were for this here. So, so you can see I'm pressing on the patient. Person is that 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 there's a glass, and that cools the epidermis, and that provides protection for the epidermis so that it's not damaged. In your imprint of the laser, it's this around three meter beams. And there's also, you may have noticed as I was doing this treatment, there's a light indicator on the laser that's built in for safety to tell you when there is enough contact with the skin, when it is safe to fire the laser, and when it's safe to lift the laser. Could you go to the next slide, please, Ashley? Great, so I think we're gonna skip this because I talked about this. This is what the laser imprint looks like. Let's get to the clinical study because that's what you all want to know. You wanna know how well does it work? Can you use it for your patients? Let's get into that. So this was a non-randomized open label study. It was 104 subjects, all who were 16 years of age and older, who had mild to severe acne. And we'll talk about the breakdown of this. But first, I just want to say a word about the size of the study. Because I, I get different feedback from different types of dermatologists. So my, my laser colleagues will often say to me, wow, over 100 patients, that's a huge study. And it is. In, in the laser world, this is a very large study. And some of my colleagues who practice general dermatology will say, well, wait a second, most acne studies are hundreds of patients. So we have to keep in mind, this is a laser. It's not a pharmaceutical. There's a different pathway through the FDA, which does not require hundreds and hundreds of patients. But 104 patients in the laser world is a huge study. With a small study, you can still have impressive results. And that's what drew me to Avaclear is when I saw the results of the study. So we can talk more about that later, but it, it is in the laser world, 104 subjects, that is an impressive study. So patients in the study had three 30 minute laser treatments spaced a month apart. None of them had any type of anesthesia. And this was a monotherapy study. So they weren't using any other treatments while they were receiving the laser or for the follow-up period, the months afterwards. So I always save the photos for the end, and I typically do that when I'm presenting clinical studies, but I'm gonna show you some of the results in photos up front so you can get an idea of what some of the patients in the study looked like, and then we'll break down what the results actually looked like. So this was one patient, and you can see on the left is baseline, and then in the middle is three months after the final or the third laser treatment. And on the right is six months after the final treatment. And as I said a couple slides ago, this was monotherapy. These patients weren't using any other topicals for acne or oral agents for acne during the treatment or for the follow-up period afterwards. So this patient at baseline was graded as a moderate acne patient, which is an IgA level three. And three months afterwards, he was graded as a one, which is almost clear, and six months afterwards, graded as a one. 
I'm going to show you one more picture and then we'll get in to the study details. So baseline, and in this patient we're looking in the middle here, six months after the final treatment session, and on the right, 12 months after the final treatment session. So I, I think that this is a really awesome result and I think any of my patients would be happy with this. Okay, so back to the study design and then we'll look at some more pictures at the end. So there were three treatments. We have baseline here on the left, treatment one, treatment two, treatment three. The treatments were about a month apart. And then the follow-up period after the third treatment was at week four, week 12, week 26, and week 52. The primary endpoint, what was being evaluated in the, in the study? Well, primarily, they were looking at the percent of patients who achieved at least a 50% reduction in their inflammatory lesion counts. And these patients whose inflammatory lesion counts got 50% improved, at least, or better, were considered to be responders. And that was the primary endpoint. Secondary endpoint were patients who were achieving an IgA score of zero or one, which means they were rated as having clear skin or almost clear skin. And this IgA score of zero or one is oftentimes an endpoint for a lot of the typical acne studies. So this is a good endpoint. Seven sites were included for this study. All of the laser treatments were done by the same two people. So there's no real, there wasn't a lot of variability there, which is good for a study. There were three assessors who were doing IgA assessments and lesion counts, and they were doing them via photographs rather than in person because this, this study was, during, was done during the height of COVID. Okay, so the patient demographics. I already mentioned that the age was 16 and up, and so here you can see the breakdown. It went from 16 to the, the oldest person in the study was age 40, and on the bar graph, you can see the breakdown between men and women here, with more of the patients being female than male. Here we have a breakdown of the Fitzpatrick skin types, and I think this is this is a, amazing for any study to have Fitzpatrick skin types two through six in the study, um, a lot of different skin types, and especially for a laser study. You know, a lot of our lasers, um, we're, we're maybe more cautious on our darker skin types, but we had two through six in this study. And then if we look at the breakdown of the IgA scores or the acne severity at baseline of the patients, um, only one of the patients had mild acne, 78% of the patients had moderate acne, and 21% of the patients had severe acne. So the vast, vast majority of patients were moderate or severe, IgA scores of three or four at baseline. So 104 people consented and enrolled. Um, four of those withdrew during the treatment phase at some point during the three treatments. 24 of them withdrew during the follow-up period, so any time between you know, their last treatment and the 52-week endpoint. All right, so let's look at the responder rate. And if you think back to a few slides ago, I mentioned that the responders were those who had at least a 50% improvement in their inflammatory lesion counts. So the percentages here are in the orange bars. So let's just focus on the orange bars. So four weeks after the third treatment, 32%, 32.6% of the patients were responders. At 12 weeks, almost 80% were responders, meaning that their inflammatory lesions were at least 50% better. At 26 weeks, it increases to 87% of the patients were responders, and at 52 weeks, 91.5% of the patients were responders. So two points to make about this. One, I think that these are great results. That's the the first point to make, and I think that those of us who treat acne, if we have over a 50% improvement in our inflammatory lesion count, they, they may not be clear, but that is significant improvement. Second point to make importantly, and we'll talk about this again and again, you can see that over time at the different follow-up periods, it seems that there's continued improvement. 
even though that third treatment may have ended 26 weeks ago, the patients are continuing to get better and better, better and better. And remember, this is monotherapy. It's not, they're not getting better and better with time because they added in a topical retinoid or they added in an oral agent. It is after the laser, they're just improving. Okay, so I also want you to look at the secondary endpoint results. So these are the patients um, that achieved an IgA score of zero or one. So they were graded as clear or almost clear. And we said the vast majority of them, 99% of them were th grades three or four at baseline. So four weeks after treatment, 9% of them were clear or almost clear. 12 weeks, almost 36% were clear or almost clear. At 26 weeks, 41.8%. At 52 weeks, 66% were clear or almost clear. So I want you to remember this 12 week mark. And I want you to try to remember this number that 36% were clear or almost clear. So how does that line up with some of our other acne studies? Now, I'm gonna show you this data. This is not to suggest that Avaclair has been studied head to head with other acne treatments because it hasn't, but let's just see what we find in the literature. And because the top graph is small, or we're gonna focus on the bottom one and I'm gonna put on my glasses. So if we look at, for example, the bottom, these are the results of a study of saracycline, which is an oral tetracycline antibiotic that's FDA approved for treating acne. So if we look at what percentage of patients in the saracycline study were clear or almost clear at 12 weeks, it was around 22% for both of their studies that they did. So not suggesting or saying that Avaclear is better than Cesar, I'm saying that they are in kind of the same realm. Avaclear did have better results. It's not a head-to-head, -head, but we just wanna keep in mind where our other acne therapeutics lie when achieving an IgA score of zero or one. So let's also look at the reduction in inflammatory lesion counts. Um, the mean absolute change in the blue line and the percentage change from baseline in the orange line. So baseline, and then you can see week four there, we started at baseline with 61, an average of 61 inflammatory lesions. And at week four had gone down to an average of 37, week 12, 28, at week 26, 18, and at week 52, down to 15 lesions on average. So if we focus in on the week 12 data, we see that the reduction in inflammatory lesion count was about 50%. So at 12 weeks or three months, about 50% reduction in inflammatory lesion counts. And again, what do we see in other types of acne studies? At the top, this is a, a graph of the results of the same saracycline study, looking at the change in inflammatory lesion counts, the percent reduction, and very similar, about 50% reduction at week 12. If we look at a topical agent such as triferritine on the bottom, and we look at the percent reduction there at 12 weeks, it was around 20 to 25-ish percent in those studies. So how did the treatment feel, the patients who were undergoing it? Well, it is a procedure. There was no anesthetic used, and patients were asked to rate their pain on a score of zero to 10. So the average was around a five for treatment one, treatment two, and treatment three, and as was the median. Now, what we really want to know too are how many patients said this is severe pain. I, you know, it, it it really is bothering me because those are the ones that are going to be hard to treat. We're not going to want to treat somebody who's in severe pain. Well, for the first treatment, one patient rated their pain level between an eight and a 10. For the second treatment, three patients did. And for the third treatment, again, one patient did. What about redness and swelling, erythema and swelling? It's what we think about a lot when we think about doing laser treatments. Well, for most of the patients, the erythema and edema resolved within a day. There were no cases of hyperpigmentation, no cases of hypopigmentation, no blistering, no scarring. And again, remember, 
Fitzpatrick skin types in this study were Fitzpatrick skin types two, three, four, five, and six, and there was no hyperpigmentation. I think that's great. And this really is in line with what my experience has been with Abiclear. I have also not had any cases of hyper or hypopigmentation. The erythema and the edema resolve very, very quickly, usually before they're out the door from my office. One um, side effect of the laser to note, and I, I think this is important, and I counsel all my patients on this, is there is this temporary acne flare. Sometimes patients will, will refer to it as an acne purge, or we can call it an acneiform eruption that may happen to some patients after each of the treatments. So in the study, pa these are patients who reported it happening between the first and second treatment. It was 53% of those. After the second treatment, 31% reported an acne eruption. And after the third treatment, 16% reported this. And this is something that does resolve with time. It can last days to up to a couple weeks. Um, but it is something that I counsel all my patients about and let them know that it may possibly happen. And I just tell them, hey, this may happen. This is expected. And I wouldn't do the treatment immediately before a really important event because your acne may worsen temporarily. So let's look at some more pictures from the clinical study. So here is a skin type 2 patient who was graded severe at baseline. And in the middle, this is three months after the last treatment, was graded as a 1, almost clear, and six months after the last treatment, also a 1. Another patient who, this patient was moderate, so not quite as severe acne at baseline, but still pretty significant, and went down to a one three months after the final treatment session and was then a zero or a clear at six months. So again, seeing that continued improvement as time goes on after the treatments have been completed. Here is a skin type six patient. Uh, she was rated as severe at baseline and went down to a moderate three months after the final treatment session. And six months after the final treatment session, she was still graded as a moderate. You know, I, I think so this patient would have been considered a non-responder. She would not have been one of those who reached that zero or one or had that success of reaching an IgA score of zero to one. But I think when we look at her photos, you know, everyone can agree she is markedly improved, but yet she only was graded to improve as one point. A fair skin patient who was graded at three at baseline and three months after the last treatment was a one and six months after the final treatment was a zero or clear. So great results. Another patient baseline six months and 12 months after the third treatment. And, and I like this photograph too, because I think this also really demonstrates, as I alluded to earlier, the improvement, not just in the acne, but the improvement that I also seem to notice in my patients that their overall skin quality looks better. Um, they seem less oily, the skin looks more even, their pores look smaller. And patients will comment to me all the time that they love that aspect of the results. Baseline, this is, is a severe patient in IgA of four, six months after the third treatment and 12 months after the third treatment was clear. Again, continued improvement with time. And another one uh, rated severe at baseline, then mild six months later, and then 12 months later was clear. Baseline, six months and 12 months, definite improvement. And I think this is the final photo from the clinical study. Now, this patient, there are photos of even two years after his final treatment session. So on the left, we have baseline and then six months after the last treatment and then two years out, went from a moderate to an almost clear. Okay, so let me spend a couple slides talking about how this has worked in, in my office and maybe give you some, some pearls that you can take home with you. So we've been using the device a little over a year since June of 2022. Um, to date, we've done a little over 250 treatments. And, and the first question I get 
all the time is, well, what, what patients, you know, are, are your best patients for Avoclare? How do you choose who's going to get Avoclare? Well, I don't necessarily choose them as much as they choose the device, to be honest, because I think it's something, it improves mild, moderate, and severe acne. So it's something I really do offer to every acne patient, just about every acne patient. Um, and I, I bring it up in the conversation when we have that initial discussion of um, there are creams, there are pills, and now there's a laser. And I do get some indication from the patients as to which direction they want to go. And, and some patients are very, very willing and wanting and looking for a laser because they want to stay away from they say, I don't want a drug, I don't want a medicine, I don't want a pill, they're sick of the creams. And I think those are the patients that seem to want Avoclare the most. But sometimes I'm I'm surprised who will want a laser and who who won't. So I bring it up to everyone during the office visit and I get some sense from the patients if they want to explore it further. Um, I still use all of the other acne therapeutics. Um, I use lots of topicals, lots of oral agents. It's not to say that this has replaced all of those in my office, but this has been a great addition to offer to patients. I don't treat patients who have a lot of acne excoriae, and I certainly don't do any procedures on patients that I suspect may have body dysmorphic disorder. It's just a problem from the get-go. I find that those patients who are most likely to do it are uh, pa patients who are in their 20s and 30s. And it usually is more women than men. The inflammatory acne in my experience, and this was the case in the clinical study as well, seems to do a little bit better than the non-inflammatory acne. So perhaps somebody who has just comedonal acne, they may not be your best candidate for Avoclare. And I say those in their 20s and 30s because I do think that procedure naive patients, those who have never had any type of procedure before, you know, maybe your teenagers or those who are really hesitant of any discomfort, they're not going to be great candidates for any procedure. Um, and so I, I just think that, you know, it's not a no go. I certainly have treated teenagers with Avoclear, but I think the best candidates are the adult patients with acne and those with inflammatory acne. How do I talk to patients about the, the laser? You know, I bring it up, as I said, in every conversation, and, and I get a sense if they want to explore laser or perhaps they want to go in a different direction, and then that's fine too. Um, at my office, I do counsel them quite a bit about the laser if they really want to go that direction, but we also have a designated medical assistant who is kind of our go-to Avoclair person. And she talks to patients in the rooms about Avoclair. She talks to patients on the phone about Avoclair, and she's great at fielding a lot of questions. And so that cuts down on the time that I need to spend talking to patients about it in great great detail. We did an email blast to all of our pre-existing patients talking about Avoclare, and that helped to generate a lot of interest in Avoclare. Oh, I went too fast. Let me go back one. There we go. How do we do it in my office? Now, I will say that I am a very, very conservative laser user. I even do all the laser hair removal in my office, yet I delegate the Avoclare. I have two RNs in my office who do the Avoclare treatment. We schedule them in 45 minute blocks because the laser from time on the face to time done is 30 minutes. And keep in mind, there's gonna be a cleanse, they're gonna decrease with acetone, you're gonna to wanna to take before photos, so before each treatment, or they're gonna sign the consent form. So we allow 45 minutes for the procedure. There's no anesthesia used for this procedure. In fact, using topical lidocaine or any other topical anesthetic is contraindicated because of the wavelength of the laser, you could get a burn on the skin. So you don't wanna do it with topical anesthetic. Um, some some practices may use other types of anesthetic. I find that with the right patient selection that that is not necessary. So we don't, uh, we don't use any anesthesia. Um, as I mentioned, we've done over 250 treatments in my office and we've had overwhelmingly positive feedback from patients. Um, I'll tell you, we have had three patients who returned 
to tell me that it didn't work. One of these patients, I was talking to him about isotretinoin and he wanted to do the laser and he came back to see me, he said it didn't work and I couldn't even find two papules on his face. And then I had to remind him where he was pre avoclear and he said, oh yes, so he looked at his pictures, yes, it's much, much better. Another patient, her acne recurred, but she had been on spironolactone prior, wasn't seeing great results. Did Avoclair, got so excited about her Avoclair results that she stopped her spironolactone and some of her acne came back. And one patient did require a course of isotretinoin afterwards. I've had many patients come back and say, I loved it, can I do it again? We haven't, it hasn't been studied as a repeat treatment course, but I, I feel safe offering it. And I have had a handful of patients do a second three course, three treatment course of it. Um, I mean, it's like any procedure that patients love. It's it's good for them and it's it's good for, for you too because they're very happy. So I showed you all these beautiful clinical photos that were taken during the study. I'm going to show you my imperfect photos that um, give you a sense of the real world results and what you can see. So this was a patient of mine who had failed just about everything on the planet. Um, and this was without any changes in any of her acne medications for months prior to Avoclair and during Avoclair. And um, this was her before treatment and this was immediately after her third um, Avoclair treatment on the right. Now, I show you this picture to point something out. I mean, clearly this young lady still has quite a bit of acne. A lot of it has calmed down and is just post-inflammatory erythema, but this is her just after two of the treatments. I find that in my experience, most patients are noticing improvement in their acne after two treatments. We tell everyone to do three, but I do tell patients, I think you're going to start to see improvement sometime after the second treatment. Sometimes it's sooner, um, but I, I do find that that is the case with most patients. And you can see she is better after two treatments. This was right, but taken right before her third treatment. So, and this is an, another gentleman and he was, um, this was before treatment on the left and this was just after two treatments. And he was there that day for his third treatment, but he's clearly better. Thank you for your time tonight. I hope that you've learned a lot about Avoclair. I would consider it in your practices. It's It's been a great addition to mine. Um, as I mentioned, I still use all the traditional acne treatments, but this has been a great addition for me to offer patients who either can't take some of our older therapeutics or just don't want to, and they want a laser. And there are a lot of those patients out there. And, and I have really found it to be a very safe, effective, and durable option for acne. So I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you so much. So Emmy, um, we do have one question. Does it also work for sebaceous hyperplasia and especially sebaceous filaments? Um, so I have not done it specifically for sebaceous hyperplasia and there are no results um, public about that yet, but I think you can, you know, it, it is an interesting question. It's one that I get a lot and I think stay tuned. Okay. So we have another question. It relates to the youngest patient that you have treated. Uh, do you think the sebaceous glands have to be fully functioning to get an outcome? Mm -hmm. And then are there any, con well, I'll let you finish that and then I'll add the next, ask the next part of the question. Okay. I think the youngest patient that I treated was 15. Um, I, I, you know, just because it is a procedure, I don't think you would want to treat anyone much younger than that. Um, and, and so that's my experience with teenagers has been more limited. It's more with the adults. Okay. So we, thinking about it, since it's acting on the sebaceous glands, do we have any information on how prolonged the we lose the sebaceous gland function, when does it return, and will you have problems with dryness when the person's older? Yeah, Th those are great questions, and um, you know those were some of my initial thoughts too. And you know, are we damaging the sebaceous gland forever? 
No, probably not forever. I talked to some great basic scientists in the sebaceous gland world about it, and they said, no, the stem cells are somewhere else. They're going to recover. But the same thing happens with isotretinoin. The sebaceous glands recover, but the acne doesn't. So, so why we we don't know? So this, you know, there there aren't studies looking at these results. Right. Histology is far enough out, but um, it is expected that the sebaceous glands probably will recover because the stem cells are still intact. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, it is possible for their sebaceous glands to come back and the acne not to return, as is the case right. with isotretinoin. Well, isotretinoin has some other systemic activities, though. So that, so, but you're right. You're you're exactly right. Is there any comparative work done with other systems such as TheraClear for acne? Yeah. So there's no head-to-head studies comp- with Avaclear and any other device or any other pharmaceutical. TheraClear is a photopneumatic device. It's totally different. It's not a 1726 nanometer wavelength. It does not target the sebaceous glands. Um, so I, I don't think it's it's in the same category. No. It's almost like comparing a retinoid and an antibiotic, right? <laughs> two different yeah. two different worlds. Is the Avaclear available in Canada? It is good question. It does actually have the um, the FDA, uh, the analogous to the FDA in Canada is, is Health Canada clearance, and has Health Canada clearance for acne and also for improving acne scars. Okay. So, how long do the results last for after? Let's say you've done three treatments and you showed some of the extended response beyond that. How long do they typically last before you you see any reasonable recurrence of acne? Yeah, that and that's a great question. Um, and that's one we don't have an answer to. And so it is tricky to counsel patients because we want to be upfront with them. Um, and, and, you know, I've had my device for a little over a year. And so what I am telling the patients is we don't know how long you'll be clear for. Um, The clinical studies suggest that most of the patients are clear for, or almost clear for up to a year, some longer, some some shorter. And that's exactly how I word it to patients. And and I feel like I'm very transparent about that and then patients have a good understanding, but, but we really don't know. So you've, uh, you know, the studies were done just with this, this particular device, but you're using it also in people that may be also utilizing some topical treatments or other, other therapies. Is yeah. there, is there a difference between those different groups when they do you see combining it with medical therapy gives them more prolonged outcomes of clearance or almost clear? Yeah, I, I do think that the best thing to do is to combine it with other therapeutics. And, and I would say, if I had to guess, probably three quarters of my patients are on combination therapy with Avaclear, and then the rest, the other 25% are on Avaclear or do Avaclear alone. Um, I think it's good for a few reasons. One, it takes a few months to see the results from the Avaclear. And also, two, in my mind, I'm wondering, am I suppressing some of that acne flare-up or acne purge that can happen after each of the treatments if they're also, say, on a topical retinoid or a systemic antibiotic. And so I try to encourage them to do something else with the laser. So if you're using combination with medical therapies, is there any period of time they have to stop certain therapies before they're treated with the Avaclear and stay off of it after the uh, Avaclear treatment? Any guidance there? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I know there are physicians who are treating patients concomitantly with isotretinoin and Avaclear. I am not, um, just because I feel like the sebaceous gland, your target chromophore isn't going to be there as much if you're on isotretinoin. I will do a lot, I have a lot of patients on spironolactone and doing Avaclear. That seems to be kind of my, my most common combination treatment and with a topical retinoid. I do have patients stop their topical retinoid two days prior. I let them resume it right away afterwards, but and it, it's not really an interaction with the laser, but I find just the the cleansing and the degreasing with the acetone pass before those patients seem to stay red for longer if they've used their topical retinoid in the last 48 hours. So that's the only thing I tell them is if they're on the topical retinoid, I have them stop, but um, then they start up right again in between the treatments and, and thereafter. 
but they don't have to stop the spironolactone or if they happen to be on an antibiotic like saracycline, for example, they don't have to stop those. Right? Nope, nope, they can stay on it, yep. So what is the longest follow-up that's been carried out in patients that have been treated with alveclear for acne? Um, to my knowledge, it's a few patients who are at the two-year mark. Okay. Do you uh, suggest any kind of dietary restriction or changes in any of the patients? Um, not specific to Avaclear. I mean, sometimes it, that's not my primary discussion to have with acne patients. If a patient really wants to change their diet because of their acne, I usually suggest that they cut out dairy, but um, that's not my primary go-to. Dietary changes aren't, aren't my primary mode of treating acne, and there's nothing specific they have to change in relationship to the Avaclear. Well, I have to tell you, Dr. Graber, no surprise, but you're getting a lot of compliments on your presentation, but there okay. are some additional questions. I think that, okay. so have there been biopsies performed, let's say six to 12 months after treatments? Do you think the entire gland is destroyed and remains destroyed? You already said the stem cells are not wiped out, so you can get regeneration of sebaceous glands, but how about any biopsy studies? Not to my knowledge. I guess we can pass that on to Katera and, and, and see if that's something that may be of interest to them. How about treatment of acne on the back or the chest yeah. even, for that matter? Yeah. Um, so currently the hand piece is, 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 was primarily created with the intention of treating the face. In my office, we'll use it to treat the face or the neck. Because the imprint size of the handpiece is a centimeter, it would take a really long time to treat a back. Um, and, and so I, I don't offer it as a treatment for the back or the chest. I do know that some clinicians have been doing that and they have told me that they have had good results. I have not heard of any problems in particular, um, but, but that's something Steve can probably comment on later too. But as of now, the handpiece is for the face. Any hair loss when you're treating the beard area? Oh, great question, yeah. So I have patients shave uh, the morning of the treatment. They can get just some very, very temporary, very kind of, it's not complete loss, but it might look a, a little bit patchy for a bit, but it's, it's very transient, have not had any long-term issues with that. Um, I certainly encourage them to treat over the beard area. We have one of the clinicians here saying that after they treat patients with oral isotretinoin, they'll often have the patients use a topical retinoid uh, continuing on after. They may not have been on that before, or it may have been some time. After treatment with Avaclear, then let's ask the question as if they were not on the topical retinoid before. You're treating with Avaclear. Would you recommend them use a topical retinoid after Avaclear or just see what the Avaclear does on its own? Well, there's very, I think a topical retinoid can't hurt in most cases. And so for a lot of patients, I encourage that. So, so yes, if I saw them in follow up after Avaclear, I, I would suggest for them to do that. And another another little uh, pearl, maybe, I Emmy, mean, I'll, I'll defer to you on this also, but, you know, topical retinoids with their, also with their benefit for photo aging doesn't hurt also, right? Especially in the age groups that you're talking about, the, the adult patients, not necessarily the teenagers, right? Right. Um, the teenagers I have are thinking, God forbid I ever get that old, right? That's what yeah. they're thinking, right? So um, the Acure laser, 1726 they're stating that in their experience it has been uncomfortable right i don't i don't have enough experience with it to know if that's across the board why would you suggest avaclear over a cure or maybe there's not an answer to that question but i'll pose that to you so i think for there's several reasons but for the clinicians on this call i think the two things to think about are the a cure laser it's a lot longer duration of treatment so it's oftentimes closer to an hour rather than 30 minutes to treat a face and so that's a long time for a treatment especially if you're doing it several times in a row um, in their clinical study when they did the treatments they utilized both topical 
and injectable anesthesia. So it, it seems to be that kind of alludes to the fact that perhaps it is a more uncomfortable treatment to do. Um, and in their clinical study, there were four treatments that were done rather than three. So I, I think from a practical standpoint, as far as what's best for our patients, it's really going to be something that's a lot faster and not as painful. Do patients need to wait at least six months after utilizing oral isotretinoin if they need to treat with Avoclear? It sounds like some people are using it during isotretinoin treatment, but I'll pose that question to you. Yeah, and to be clear, you know, I do lots of lasers while patients are on isotretinoin as the result of some of the recent systematic reviews, but Avoclear, just because it does target the sebaceous gland, I don't do concomitantly. I have done it on patients just two months after they finished isotretinoin. I think that was my earliest. Um, and the, the I, there's a small handful of them, of course, because a lot of patients do great on isotretinoin, but the ones that I've treated have had no problems and did well. Yeah, that six months of, seems to linger in people's minds that they can't do anything post isotretinoin, and, and we know that that's certainly not true. Another comment that it was a great lecture. So we have a, I haven't seen any that said they didn't like the lecture so far, Emmy. So you're doing really, you're batting a thousand. Okay. You said it was lousy. That's great. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Steve Kreider to, to chime in um, here because there are some questions about the the costs of the laser. <laughs> what people are typically charging, patient acceptance of the financial aspects of it. And I know you, Dr. Graber knows what she does in her office, but you mm -hmm. deal with many clinicians that have it around the country. Maybe you can give a sense of that. Sure, yeah, happy to. And so um, I'd say probably the most common price that people are charging is about $3,000 for this. I think, um, you know, in, in affluent suburbs, I've seen people move up to about $3,600 for this. And- Is um, that for a package of treatments or for exactly, one? Exactly, that, that would be for the course, for all three treatments. And so Dr. Graber, I'm not sure, what are you charging right now for a course of three? I would fit in more towards your affluent neighborhood end. Okay, <laughs> yeah. A little over that's generally, Yeah, so that's generally what we're seeing around the country. Yeah. So what about, um, you know, the patient acceptance of the financial aspects of it? Maybe Emmy you, you, or, or Steve, whoever wants to take that question. Both take it. Dr. Graber, go ahead first. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about that because I think, you know, we're, we're physicians. We, we don't want to sell something to our patients. We don't, it, it, talking about price with patients doesn't come naturally to us and, and it's hard, right? And so, the, the way I approach it, like I said earlier, is I just bring it up. I say there's a laser option, but it's it's never covered. It's not covered by insurance. Um, it It's probably a pricier option. And some of them say, you know, I want to hear about it. And some of them don't. And, and so I don't push the issue any further for those who don't. And for those who are interested, then I, I continue on and, and talk about it and tell them what the cost is going to be. And um, I, I don't, you know, I think it's best to approach this not making any assumptions about individual patients and what they are willing to pay, because there really is, a, you know, patients are, it, it's their face. They really want to pay for their skin and they're willing to do it. And some of them just, you know, even if we're talking to them about one of the safest drugs in the world, they don't want to take it. Um, and so sometimes I'm surprised how often I've talked, started talking to patients about a certain oral medication or topical medication and then they'll say to me well i heard there's a laser I'm like, oh yeah there is let's let's talk about that and then they want to go that route so i i think you know if we if we broach it in a general way it's it's really accepted by patients and we can feel good about it you know i i find my last five to ten years the dentists have it down in terms of how to handle what things cost and not only the cosmetic aspects of it but a lot of the procedural things that they do, whether it's implants or even basic things, they send you to another office and there's someone else that talks to you about the price after they've talked to you about what the different options are, not forcing you, but letting you know. They they have that down to a science. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it, do you utilize someone else to do that for you, Emmy? Or do you no, do it yourself? You know, I talk about price with all of my patients. I know not all dermatologists do that. Um, I think I've gotten more comfortable doing it because I do a lot of lasers and cosmetic dermatology. And so I just, 
I say the cost is this up front and um, you know, I just find it, it saves everybody a lot of aggravation and embarrassment later if you're just completely transparent and put it out there at the beginning. So I do it, do it myself. So most people are happy. You you mentioned that, and I, I think that that's good, and I'm, I'm sure Qtera is happy about that. But what about the patient that gets a less than optimal result, and you're looking at them and you agree? It's not that mm -hmm. patient that looks great, but they have one lesion, and now they're complaining that it didn't work. The patient yeah. that really did not get that favorable outcome, and they put out $3,600 or what? How do you how do you handle that? Yeah, that's always a situation that we don't want to be in, and so I think. For me, I am so careful when I counsel patients up front to tell them, you know, not every single person who gets this laser treatment is going to be clear or almost clear. You know, we're talking about most here. I, I, I can't guarantee it. I, and I say to patients, I can't guarantee any medication it is going to, right. it's going to be clear. Um, and so I think it's really all about setting up the right expectations. And so to be honest, for that one patient that I said that came back and needed to go on isotretinoin, she she was fine with it. And I don't think it was because she was uh, financially very well off, but she said, you know, you told me I wanted to try everything before I did isotretinoin and I did. And, and you know, it, it, it didn't it didn't clear me. So I think it's all about the counseling up front. And, you know, it, it's, it's a laser. It's a great laser. It's, it's not a magic wand, but, but it's a very good device. And I think, you know, just being realistic with our patients is, goes a long way for everyone in the end. Yeah, and for our colleagues that have a, the staff do a lot of it, make sure everybody's on the same page, right? You know, that nobody's promising them, oh, everybody I've seen cleared up, you're going to clear up too or something like that. That That's so important. Do you have any final comments here? I don't see any additional. I'll give people a minute or so to get a final question, and we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, Dr. Del Rosso, uh, Dr. Graber, you know, hit that one out of the park as far as the, uh, the model, the pricing and everything. Just a couple things that I would just add. I, I, I love your analogy to the dental market, because I think we would love to be um, akin to Align Technologies when we grow up, right? And that you've built a business that is uh, synonymous with straightening teeth and is really a value add, a way to, for the dermatology community to grow their businesses. We really want that to happen over the next decade plus. Um, Dr. Graber mentioned a lot of her patients are these young adult women who want to treat their acne a little bit differently. We're seeing that nationwide. We get great analytics on all the all the treatments that are done so we get to see patient demographics and this group is really resonating towards this and um, you know they make their own healthcare and financial decisions and they see it as something that's important to them in their career and being taken seriously and moving ahead and getting rid of acne and the only two other things I just mentioned quickly is financing is available we have an exclusive arrangement with care credit for a $99 a month program uh, so that's available through us and then people can also use their flexible spend health savings accounts those types of things Interesting. Great. Very good. Any final comments, my friend and colleague, Dr. Graber? No, I just, I think my, my last comment is, I think this is good. Even if you're listening and you're thinking, you know, I just don't want to laser my office. I know Jim, you always say, I don't even know how to plug in a laser. That's fine. But I think this is good to know about as an option. So if you have a patient that wants a laser option, you can send them to a colleague who, who does it, or at least know about it, to talk to them about it. So um, I thank everyone, whether they're a laser person or not a laser person tonight for, for listening and learning. So I mean, it's the same way with me with Italian food. You don't want me cooking it, like you don't want me working the laser, but I love Italian food and I love that we have these devices. I mean, it's we have colleagues that do it. It's it's nice to have a lot of options on the menu. So thank you, Dr. Graber. Thank you, Steve. Steve thank Kreider. you. And one, one more thing I would just like to say, again, this is a long-term journey with the dermatology community. So we really appreciate it and everybody jo joining tonight. Uh, if you're interested, please reach out to your Qtera representative or go to obviclear.com, hit the provider link, and then you can get on the list to become a, a provider. And um, I'd also just like to comment that um, we really take it to heart, things that Dr. Graber say, my friend, Julie, uh, Dr. Julie Harper, um, we're really making some changes as well to really meet you guys where you are. And so we're tweaking some things on our end and I think you're going to see uh, some incredible updates right around the corner. So thank you so much for being with us tonight.
Thank you very much. And thank you, RBC consultants, for helping to put together this. So I think was a very, very, not very good, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. Me. And thank you again. Thank you again to our supporter, Qterra, for making this event possible and for everyone for joining us this evening. Good night. Everyone.